for that gritty 70s vibe all along. Speaking of which, Roy made a lot of great movies in the 70s. I'm just curious. I mean, he was obviously on your radar. I think you developed Cohen for Roy Scheider. Um, are there any other movies of his that, you know, are among your favorites or that you really enjoy? Yeah, Marathon Man, which I guess was also a somewhat deadly character, that he, uh, not more than favorite, but very deadly character that he played in that. But also a guy who had a tremendous, you know, tremendous love for his brother and had a lot of heart and was a pretty well-rounded human being, but was also an assassin. Um, but yeah, it was Jaws, uh, Marathon Man, Blue Thunder. I mean, all, all, oh, and The French Connection, of course. He just had a, I'm from New York originally, and you know, he was sort of, to me, kind of like the ultimate New York actor. He, he just was, he, he radiated it. He was just in, in, in a string of like totally great, you know, just badass movies. And Cohen and Tate, certainly one of them. Um, it's, Jaws actually has one of the ultimate Shider moments. That's very much, you know, it's the scene where he's ladling the chum and the shark appears and he, yeah. he just sits up. He has this blank look in his, his face. See, that was mm -hmm. very much part of Roy's technique. You know, he, he believed that the script was the writer's until he came up with the physical gesture. Like literally, he had to communicate it physically. You know, he would come up with a physical gesture or expression. For that moment, then it became his. And that was the perfect, he knew that there was no way after seeing that shark, there was no big expression you could do. The best thing to do was to have no expression. And mm -hmm. that was the kind of, that, that's what made him so enthralling to work with, you know, because he, he really would find the right body language or look or expression to sell the scene. One of my favorite moments making that movie, I mean, was we just, we, had, we took about 15 minutes. I, I needed to get some shots in the rear view mirror of Cohen's eyes, uh, just because I knew we were going to use them throughout the movie and the cutting. So I remember sitting in the car with Shider with the camera in the back seat, filming, and I was just sat next to him and I gave him different, um, that, and all we were focused on, all the camera was focused on was his eyes reflected in the rear view mirror. Uh, I would give him different, uh, emotions anger suspicion this that or the other and it was fascinating and he just watched it and it, it like his eyes changed perfectly he was such a craftsman such a, a fantastic craftsman i mean it's something the old stars or the older stars were really good at i mean it, I, I was very lucky to have him in my first film really. i really think his performance in cohen and tate is pitch perfect in basically every scene uh, he he's He's fully into what he's doing there. Uh, he was certainly my first choice, Clay Cohen. Uh, it would, the company never thought we'd get him. Uh, so we actually <laughs> had to make offers to a few other actors before we, we, we they, they had the nerve to make an, an offer to Shatter. But I knew Shatter would do it uh, because Cohen has, um, you know, he's he has a lot of, it's a darker version of a lot of the, the values that uh, Roy brings brings to roles. I mean, he, you know, he in his way he's heroic, he's tough, he's he's, you know, um, but you know, but he's also Cohen. Even though he's, you know, he's a he's a hitman. He's also kind of a samurai. You know, he's got a code of honor. A lot of things that, in terms of, I, I think it would. I felt that Roy would would want to do the role because it would give him a chance about to do that kind of archetypal uh, movie gangster character that James Cagney would play or Alan Delon or Yves Montand. Real. So I wasn't surprised when, uh, when the, I wasn't surprised when he took the role. It's both the character of John Ryder in The Hitcher and, and Shire's character, Cohen, intentionally have no backstory. You know, there's there, because when you don't explain um, the backstory to the audience, where you keep that, uh, you know, it, it, it creates a sense of mystery about the character. But in both cases, um, I asked uh, both Roy and, and also Rutger at one point on the set, just because I was curious, not because for any other reason, but I said, you know, what's your backstory? Have you, do, do you have a backstory for yourself on this? 
And Rutger had none. Rutger, you know, just his, the way he would, he played scenes in the moment, you know. He could have cared less about the backstory. But Scheider had his character worked out from the day he was born. It was phenomenal. For about 15 minutes, he walked me through his backstory for Cohen. And, you know, if you've seen the film, you know, and his, his name Cohen, and he's a loner uh, hitman. You know, sure. had, it basically revolved around him being a Jewish contract killer in, in the Italian mafia, which for Roy was kind of essential because that's why he, he was alone. That's why he worked alone. But that, right. was the, that was just the tip of the iceberg. He, he had it so worked out. And that, that was kind of the beauty of, 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 of one of the great things about Shatter as an actor was how prepared he was. You know, he, he was really trained out of that whole method acting school in, in you know, New York in the 60s and 70s. And right. just such preparation and detail in this performance. You being, I believe, 26 at the time or, or thereabouts, and being the writer of this movie, it says a lot about you as a director and your your instincts to have the confidence to let someone mold and shape your story like that. He he didn't change he he didn't change the character of the lines of the story. He just had his own personal explanation for himself as an actor about why Cohen was who he was, doing what he did in the movie. When we first hired Roy, you know, we were down in Texas and we were getting ready to film. And Shatter uh, came before he accepted the role. He loved the script. But before he accepted the role, he wanted to come down and meet me. You know, I, I think that, you know, movie stars, particularly with first-time directors and first-time writer directors, you know, he had what is a very natural apprehension. You know, he wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to give him line readings. You know, that he would have the room to develop his character properly and to follow his instincts, which is why we hired him in the first place. Sure. Um, but Roy and I came down, we had dinner um, with one of the producers, and we, um, I mean, Roy couldn't, you know, he, he couldn't have been more professional and gracious. But, you know, we it was, we, it was really a business meeting. We went down and we went through the script, you know, really mm -hmm. line by line. And everything was going great. I mean, it was... A, it, it really was a good meeting. We both saw eye to eye until we didn't. Uh, and Roy suddenly, at one point in the comes in, in the um, in our meeting, said, "You know, I've only got one problem with the script. You know, it's we never. He, it was a big deal for Roy as he articulated it um, that we never saw his character, his hitman character, with anybody else but this other hitman and this kid, really." You know, and he felt very strongly, he didn't want his character to appear, come off like a fiend. And he wanted to, it was very important to him to have a scene in the movie where we saw him with other people in his life. So we knew he was a real, you know, human being. Um, but that was a problem for me. Because the whole movie, if you've seen Cohen and Tate, is really three people in a car. And th there's very intentionally no backstory with Cohen and Cohen or Tate. They're revealed who they are is revealed in present tense in their through their interactions and how they deal with situation. And to have a scene in the movie, I felt where you actually showed Cohen with a family member or with a friend um, would have destroyed the movie. Uh, you know, th that was simply not what this movie was. This movie was really a road movie. You know, on a night highway with three hit with three characters in a car, and I explained that to Roy. I said, you know, I could not see making this film and breaking the four walls of the picture, so to speak. Um, and we had a moment there where it didn't look like we were going to be working together. I sat and I thought for a minute, and I kind of digested what um, what Schrader was getting at, what he wanted in the role, and suddenly I had an idea. I said, listen, what if late in the movie, um, we have a scene where when Cohen knows he's going to die, they're driving along and he sees a mailbox on the side of the road. And he pulls off to the side of the road, gets out of the car, takes out an envelope, puts money in it. This envelope's pre-addressed. We know it's to a daughter, a wife, a loved one, but someone he cares about. Um, and he, he puts the money in the envelope and he mails the letter. So we establish that he does have somebody else out there, beyond the, the other two characters. 
and Shatter, he smiled and he said, that does it for me. That was really the instinct he had there. That was an example, I would say, that happened a few times making the movie, um, where, you know, I was able to, he would have an idea and I'd, I'd find a way to make it work. And it was always, um, it, it always really improved the movie. I had something in the script, which none of the producers thought he would, uh, he would ever go for, uh, which was a hearing aid. You know, because I, I, I felt that, um, you know, you've got this guy who's such a formidable killer that he needed something to humanize him, some kind of vulnerability, and that the hearing aid was a nice touch. But Roy had no problem with that. But but at two o'clock in the morning one night, he called me up, and you remember Roy, you know, he, he talked very fast. He said, hey, mm -hmm. Eric, you know, listen, as long as we get the hearing aid, let's use it. Let's, let's find a scene for it. Uh, you know, but like, what if he lost the hearing aid and he couldn't hear? And of course, that's a, that's brilliant, great. A, a brilliant idea. And immediately when he said that, I said, at a, I, I thought of having to get the kid who he's, he's kidnapped, who's taken back, probably killed, but having to enlist this kid to help him find the hearing aid. Um, so that scene in the movie, that came out of Roy's, that, that was one of Roy's ideas. You know, he didn't throw ideas at you very often, but when he did, they were all really, really good like that. And where we were able to actually take it. I mean, I think I wrote that scene that night and we shot it the next day. You know, actors of, I think, you know, his generation, you know, they were they were tremendously prepared. Um, they had a great base and craft, um, but also, you know, they, you know, the great stars knew how to bring the audience in. They knew how to find something about the character that that made the audience pull for them. You know, I mean, you you, you don't really root for Roy Scheider and Colin and Tate, but you feel for him. You get, you get involved with him in his his finale. I mean, I think his final moments in that with the corner by the police, that's some of Scheider's best work ever. Everyone, please check out Eric's work and his novels. He's got a great imagination. You can certainly escape in his work, so be sure to check it out. And so thanks again, Eric. Thanks, Mike. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks.